Thank you very much. Thank you for uh, coming. It, I know it's the last session of the day, so I'll uh, try to keep it light. And uh, I thought I would uh, start with a quiz. Okay, so um, if you read the New York Times uh, Gail Collins article, articles, you know that she always likes to put quizzes on, in her articles. So I started um, by introducing the topic of interest groups by um, mentioning something that, I guess, again, unless you've been in a cave the last uh, 24 hours, you probably have heard that the US pulled out of the Paris uh, Climate Agreement. And uh, so the quiz is, which I'm not going to collect votes on, although if you're eager and you want to raise your hand, <laughs> go ahead, is, uh, you know, which, you know, if you do by introspection, you know, which one of the possible causes, which I could list here, and, you know, there are probably others, um, I think cause that. And so one is that voters overall did not support the climate agreement. And uh, second is that there was concern over the coal industry jobs. And then third, uh, the influence of the fossil uh, uh, fuel industry. And so a few facts to help you sort of decide is that um, seven out of 10 Americans tend to support uh, the Paris Agreement. Um, if you go more in, de in depth and, uh, uh, and look at the voters in the coal industry, the coal industry doesn't su supports only um, uh, as many workers as Arby's uh, at most. And uh, the third fact that I'd like to, to uh, bring to you is that uh, Scott Pruitt, which is the current EPA administrator, uh, has been uh, um, has, uh, actually sued the EPA itself 14 times before being appointed and was thanked, thanked for work to push back against President Obama's EPA and its access with liberal environment groups by caught, uh, Coke or whatever you, you pronounce it funded Americans for Prosperity. So you know, this is just you know sort of a, a motivation to start with. You know, obviously you know where I'm leaning towards, but um, you know uh, I have have been working a lot of, on interest groups, and you know I really don't like the gotcha kind of approach to things. So I'll try to be a bit more uh, uh, identified in terms of you know <laughs> what causes what. Uh, in, in the strategy, and so here's uh, um, sort of the view that I have. So I, I decided to start with a, with a diagram because I think diagrams are very helpful. Uh, sort of a simplified view of sort of the, this sort of literature on interest groups and, uh, and their influence on, on, uh, on ultimately on policy. So, and uh, the, the, the red lines are gonna be the things that I'm gonna spend most of the time today on, and obviously there's interesting work on on everything else in, uh, in, this, in this graph and possibly other channels that I'm not identifying. But so, if you think of politicians being sort of the, uh, the, the target of, of influence, of uh, inf influence by interest groups, you can think of interest groups sort of behaving, I'm gonna sit, I'm gonna be here, uh, behaving in a way that sort of tries to affect politicians in direct ways and indirect ways, and ultimately on policy also through other potential actors I'm gonna discuss. So let's think about sort of the most common way that uh, people think about uh, influence, which is campaign contributions. How interest groups affect politicians through campaign contributions. That's the main channel. I'll discuss that extensively. Um, then there's another channel that I'm going to talk about today, which is votes. Campaign interest groups are large groups, blocks of voters, and uh, I'll show you that we have evidence that uh, they also affect uh, politicians through their promises of votes. The third actually what I'm going to spend um, most of the time today, which is sort of a, 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 new, uh, um, a new paper that we're working on, is charitable contributions that can be of help to the politician. I'll be very clear about that. So um, the rest of the talk will focus about on the literature, but I'm really presenting something new that is sort of fresh off uh, uh, Stata, and which is sort of this, uh, this channel here. I'll be much more explicit. Now, interest groups, though, also act in other ways through lobbyists. So you probably have heard a lot about K Street, and this is the way that interest groups don't go directly to talk to politicians. They hire lobbyists to talk to politicians. And, co and so that's a, that's a flow that often sees, well, that sees mostly money going to lobbyists, and lobbying, and lobbyists sort of giving information. And, and it doesn't have to be useful in information, but just information. It doesn't have to be unbiased information, but it's information. Then politicians, and then the last uh, uh, channel that I'm also going to sort of briefly cite because this is a really research in progress, is the, the effect of interest groups 
on regulatory agencies and uh, sort of the flow of information on interest groups on, rev, uh, on regulatory agencies and then regulatory agencies can affect the policy through the, what we call the rulemaking process. And, and, uh, and in particular, I'll talk br very briefly about Dodd-Frank in, in that context. So why, I mean, ultimately, you know, why do, how are politicians do affect policy in the end? Well, they affect it through two channels. One is through uh, sort of roll, roll call votes, and this is, I'm gonna talk about the US in case this, this wasn't clear sufficiently. <laughs> um, and so the roll call votes, so the votes in the, in the, uh, the uh, arrive on the floor, but I think we, you know, many pe th people think more significantly through committee assignments, so the committee work that they do. Now, finally, you know, a lot of the, the channels on campaign contributions uh, are studied because we know that, you know, why do politicians need to raise so much money? Well, because they affect, we think that campaign expenditures affect votes through this channel. And then voters uh, also affect politicians through their votes, obviously, and campaign contributions. Okay, so campaign contribution comes both from interest groups and from voters in different shares, and we'll see that. So this is really sort of to give you, and again, uh, we'll talk about these sort of uh, um, five channels here. All right, so let's start with campaign contributions. Okay, this is a huge area, so I'm not gonna do justice to it by, uh, but the, the basic story here is that campaign, campaigns are expensive, and they are, just to give you a sense of the numbers, um, there's about, um, in the, just to give you an example in the 2016 race, we, we, which just ended, um, the presidential race total was 2.4 billion. The congressional races in total was 4 billion. And you know, the individual race was uh, 64 millions in the Senate, the most expensive one. And the most expensive race, um, that was the Florida one, and Wisconsin first district was uh, 21 million dollars. So these are large numbers, right? And which is kind of justify why there's a, uh, a big focus on, on uh, raising money for, for politicians. Now, of course, the means are much slower, but this is gonna give you a sense of the magnitude. Now, where do these contributions come from and why does it matter? Well, a lot of contributions come from individual, individuals, you know, just contributing small amounts. Okay, the grassroots, you know, sort of the, the individual uh, sending a hundred dollar check to their favorite presidential uh, candidate. Now, that's true, it's, uh, for presidential candidates, that's a majority, but there are, Things that we, you know, from a, you know, from an interest group perspective, obviously are more interesting, which is PACs. These are these political action committees, which are essentially set up by corporations because corporations are prevented from giving money directly from their uh, their, uh, their budget to the to the uh, to the candidates. They have to set to to um, create these segregated funds. Okay, so these segregated funds, then you know, employees contribute to those, and so then there are these super PACs. Okay, so the super PACs are a little bit more uh, sort of, you know, a, a bit of a recent phenomenon, although they've been around for a very long time. It's just that the Citizens United decision sort of really uh, removed the lid on those and sort of expanded uh, uh, a lot the, the, the scope of this. And to give you an, an idea of how big these are, you know, these are, you know, in the 2016 cycle, these were per se, you know, 120, uh, two, uh, 192 million dollars for the pro Clinton one, one of the pro Trump ones with 50 million. So these are large uh, 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 objects again. But this is really where most of the literature has spent uh, time on. Why? Because we can identify very clearly where the money comes from. Many of these super PACs, uh, actually, the 501Cs, we don't know where the money comes from. The super PACs, actually, we do know, but those have not been around as long. So PAC is where we, we spent mono, most of the time. Now, there's a very famous paper in this literature that's uh, by uh, Ansola, oh, I always get, Ansola Behere, uh, De, De Figueiredo and Snyder, that actually it was a very provocative paper in, in the Journal of Economic Perspective in 2003 that said, well, you know, really, we think of these PACs, these interest groups kind of, you know, using this money in not a kind of a quid pro quo way, but really this money comes primarily from individuals. Well, that's true for presidential races, but for congressional races, actually 40% in the Congress, in Congress, uh, in the House, and 20% uh, in the Senate comes from these PACs. Okay, so these are corporations, unions, which for which we can identify very clearly, uh, uh, sort of, you know, at least their potential uh, desires. Okay, now, um, in terms of the theory, 
there's a, you know, the, 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 of course, you know, the political scientists, and I don't know if there are some here, they always sort of semi make fun of us for um, sort of putting this in the starkest, pos starkest possible way. I give you money and you give me policy. You know, so a very, you know, sort of an economist approach to this. So that's, you know, admittedly, maybe, you know, it's a bit uh, raw, okay? Um, but this is the way that people have thought a lot about this problem, and, you know, many people have thought about this problem, and, you know, Grossman and Heltman, in the book in 2001 kind of summarizes this. And so they kind of depict, you know, in this, in this approach, uh, people depict sort of a market for policy, sort of where there's an exchange of policy, you know, votes for money, okay? Obviously, that's illegal, but that's another problem. So how have people tried to measure this? Well, there's been two strands of empirical evidence, okay? And if you think about it, you see there's like, how, how would I go about testing this? Well, again, the economist approach would be, well, I try to look at the vote by the politicians as a function of the money they get, right? That's quantity regressed on, not price, but revenues, right? <laughs> so, and that's been the approach in the campaign contributions and roll call votes. There's a, a massive uh, literature about this, and this is, Summarize again in this uh, Ansel Abere, uh, I'm gonna call it AFS from now on, for obvious reasons. And, um, and this, they summarize about you know, 40 studies, but there's even more. And I'll, I'll show you in a second you know, that you know, those studies don't, are not very conclusive. But there's a second approach, which is what I'm gonna advocate is a more promising one, which is looking at campaign contributions sort of and uh, committee assignments, okay? So first of all, uh, why? All right. Actually, that's what more recently, so this campaign contributions and committee assignment is something that essentially looking at campaign contributions as a function of where the uh, politicians are sitting, which kind of committees they're sitting on, okay? So that is, for example, the early, approach, the early examples of this come from the 90s, but then more recently, uh, many political scientists have, have sort of uh, agreed, have sort of uh, uh, come you know, so come to agree on that this is sort of a, a desirable approach. Let's see why. Okay, so the first, the first thing is that if you think about it, this is a typical specification that people would, uh, uh, would run. It would be the roll call vote, so looking at your individual votes, okay, politician P, okay, in, an, in, a, in a topic that's of interest to group F, let's say the dairy industry, at, in a Congress T and as a function of contributions. Now, of course, the moment you stare at it for you know, a millisecond, you figure out that uh, you know, this kind of resembles estimating a demand and supply problem, right? The problem is you only have, have one equation, right? So you're estimating uh, you know, quantity on, let's call it price, but I'm gonna say quantity on a, a, you know, a form of price, which is contributions. Now, when you think about it, what are we interested in here? So I think, you know, I think we would all agree that what we're interested in here is the supply side of this, right? That you're interested in sort of how, you know, how much are they selling for this policy? You know, how much can an extra dollar buy? So I think that's, you know, if I sit there for a second, I mean, this is not something, you know, this is my own interpretation of this, is that what we're interested in is alpha one is sort of a measure of the supply of, uh, of, this, of these uh, votes. Now, the problem is that most of the time, you know, this simultaneity problem is not even acknowledged, you know, in the early studies. There are exceptions, so about one third of those studies that I mentioned do use an IV strategy. But what kind of IV strategy do, do you wanna use? So you're, if, you're, if, you're, if you're trying to trace out the supply, what kind of strategy do you wanna use? Well, you want some variation in the demand, right? That way you can trace out the supply. The problem is that when they use the IV, they use a combination of shocks of demand and supply to IV for the contributions, which is a bit uh, confusing, and so, um, as you can imagine, gives all sorts of results, okay? So, um, so the, 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 the final word on this is that when you look at these sort of, and you, you know, you can look at this review, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's great, this AFS paper sort of shows that you can find everything. You can find some positives, but most of them don't find anything, even you find the, uh, you know, uh, the opposite side, the opposite sign. So, why am I going against this? So, for, for the obvious reason that, you know, number two is that identification uh, issues are a problem, okay? And, you know, I don't have the great, uh, the great instrument, although the demand ones are the ones that I would prefer in that case. 
But even for more substanti you know, substantive and sort of uh, relevant reasons here is that really, you're not supposed to sell votes, okay? That's very visible. Your oral call vote is the most visible action that a politician can take. So if you are not, you know, it's legal, okay? So if you are gonna take an action, don't take it in the most visible way. So this, these are, you know, and, uh, and, uh, and so this is sort of the argument that also uh, Powell and Grimmer kind of bring to the fore. And then the third point is that roll call votes are not that important once you, the, the bill has already arrived to the floor, right? It has arrived to the floor, it's a yes or no vote. Many of the votes are non-pivotal. And so you can see why that would not be where the action is. So many, again, you know, many of these later studies have agreed that sort of, you know, in the committees is where the legislation is drafted, is where the, all the, you know, the agenda is set. And so that's where I argue that, you know, we argue that that's where we should, we should look. And so, um, and so that's the sort of the, the motivation here. And then the other thing is that we have instruments for the assignment to committees. So as you probably can imagine, there is some self-selection into committees, right? So you're interested, you know, you're in, in Arkansas, you're probably gonna try to get on the agricultural committee. But uh, we know that there's rules for assignment to committees in the, in, the, in, uh, in the Senate and in Congress. And these have been established, you know, for a long time. And so I'm gonna use those like seniority and, uh, and uh, the openings, the fact that there are some openings on committees make it possible for you to move. If there's no openings, you can't move. And that's kind of exogenous to your own electoral sort of uh, uh, destiny, right? So that's where uh, I'm gonna argue that's the main, uh, uh, the main, um, uh, way to go. And I'm going to use this in, in the, the new work that we're doing where we look at charitable contributions as well. So second is votes. Okay, so let me go back to a very interesting puzzle that was raised in the 60s by Taluk, which is that if you think about, well, one, one view of the world is that there's too much money in, into politics, right? That's what I started off with. But then his point was, you know, look, there's so much money to be gained from being in politics that maybe there's too little money into politics. You know, essentially, if you look at, for example, you know, this is an example that, uh, you know, is just following this uh, paper, you know, these AFS papers, that in 2000, the total USDA subsidies were, uh, to agriculture, were about $22 billion. And if you look at the campaign contributions by the agricultural sector is 3.3 million. So that gives you a return of $6,665 per dollar spent, which is something I think we would all like to uh, subscribe to. Um, but then our observation in a paper uh, with uh, uh, Francesco Trebbi in, in 2011 that you know, maybe that's not what all that, that uh, interest groups do, is that they, they don't only give money, they promise votes, they can mobilize voters. And so in particular, you know, this quote from, it's about Walmart, um, and Walmart, you know, in this case, you know, it was a case in which Walmart distributed a letter to employees highlighting what it said were inaccuracies and criticism by Governor X and Y. And so the letter encouraged employees to talk to friends, neighbors, and family about the good that Walmart does. Okay, so this was, uh, you know, just to say, you know, Walmart can uh, sort of uh, mobilize its workers. And if you plot the amount of campaign contributions that Walmart gives as a function of how many workers it employs in different states, you see, and, and this we obviously in the paper do it not just for Walmart, but you see there's like, you know, it tends to increase with the size of the, the, the employment. So on the vertical axis, the contributions and the, ver the horizontal axis is the, the employment, Walmart, Walmart employment in different states. You see that there's, you know, it increases but kind of declines. So this is in general a, uh, you know, there's a decline in the amount of campaign contributions for groups in, in states where the groups are very, very large. So why is that? So our interpretation is that when politicians, and this is, well, if you put Arkansas into it, which is where Walmart is based, obviously that's over there, right? Um, but you know, just to show that the, the, uh, the hump shape is there for uh, with or without Arkansas. But the idea is that, you know, yes, if you're a bigger group, you probably are asked to pay more money because you can extract a bigger amount, you know, there's just more surplus to be shared from a, a given policy, but, you also can promise votes in exchange for, uh, instead of giving money. And so maybe you have to give less money when you have a bigger group, okay? 
So in that paper, what we do is that we estimate the value of money of, of these campaign contributions, and we sort of, you know, I'm not going to go into the uh, into the um, the details, but we we find that the value of a dollar of a vote is about $145. So it's essentially that you can either give me a vote or you can give me $145. Okay, so that's the average value of a vote. And if you do that, well, then that return becomes a lot smaller. You know, instead of dividing it. You know, the, whatever that, uh, you know, the, the, three, the 22 billion by 3.3 million, you have to add the value of all the votes that are in the, uh, in the um, that the agricultural uh, group can offer. Okay, because the agricultural, you know, the agricultural lobby can offer about uh, 2 million uh, votes. Okay, so it can mobilize uh, votes in about 2 million. So when you do that, the return is still very good for anyone here that, I don't know where you invest your money, but $71 for every dollar invested is still a pretty good return. But just to show that you can't just use one channel. You just have to use all the channels at the same time to calculate what the, 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 the return is. And these obviously are average returns instead of marginal, but that's all we could do. So let me go to the other, uh, the channel. I don't know if, should, uh, if, I, if the people have questions they're allowed to ask as we go or? Yeah, so yeah, if you have questions, please go, because this is, I get, um, I can talk very fast, as you probably can see, but, uh, so, all right, so let's talk about lobbying. So I gave you some numbers for, uh, for, com for campaign contributions, and those are large, but when you go to the lobbying uh, industry, well, those numbers are even larger, okay? So if you look at, this is from my favorite website ever, <laughs> which is opensecrets.org, which is, you know, Please finance it because they're a nonprofit, and uh, you know I use their data a lot, so I try to pay them out of my shirk. But uh, you know, it's, they use they can work as RA basically for uh, for free otherwise. So, um, so this is the if you look at the spending, this has become a, a more than three billion dollar uh, um, sort of uh, industry, which again you sort of compare with you know the pack, the pack size is is much smaller. Okay, so it's about one fifth of that. And this is employs, you know, uh, about 10,000 uh, lobbyists a year, okay? And this is only the federal lobbying. Now, what do lobbyists do, though? Okay, so we go back to the initial sort of graph where we think of, well, that's another channel in which politicians can be affected by, uh, by, um, uh, by interest group is through lobbyists. So if you think about, so you sit here and you're like, well, I don't know, what does a lobbyist do? I'm not sure. I know it talks to politicians. I'm not sure what they tell them. Um, the, the theory is all over, you know, it's, it's sort of very much skewed in favor of lobbyists. So the theories in political science that we have is that essentially they're sending information. Okay, and uh, however biased that information is, is that, sorry, I'm just going to go to this. Um, it can still be welfare enhancing. So you're better off with more information than less, even though you're biased, because you can, you, can, you can incorporate the fact that they have a bias, so you can, you can use the good part of the information. And this is an, there's a huge uh, theoretical literature about informational lobbying and how signaling or cheap talk can be well for improving. So essentially, these, uh, these, these uh, lobbyists are communicating things to the politician that otherwise the politician wouldn't know. So they're better informed than the politician himself about policies that are relevant to their clients. Now, that's very hard to test, right? Because we don't know what they're told, okay? The only data that we have, and this is already great, uh, comes from essentially a requirement coming from the Lobbying Disclosure Act of 95, which is tells every lobbyist in the US to register if they have any contact with the Congress, with the President, and with uh, regulatory agencies. And so, what we know from those is that we know how much money each, let's say, Pfizer uh, hires a lobbyist to uh, uh, a lobbyist, you know, to, to communicate information uh, information about you know, patents. Uh, just one <laughs> random one. Um, they have to reveal how much money they spend. They, Pfizer gives to this lobbying firm. What topics uh, the lobbyists communicated on? with the various agents that it communicated on with Congress, let's say. Notice that they only have to say which, you know, which, uh, if they communicated with Congress or not. They cannot, they don't have to say which politician they talk to. And then last, what you know is that, um, uh, as I said, sort of specific topics in which they work. So, and the data actually has been available since, uh, well, 
in, in really complete and clean form again from open thanks to open secrets uh, you know in the last in the you know in the, in the 2000 since 2010 before that the data was available but it was very sort of hard to get and this is when we started working on it it was really like in PDF form but the data is available uh, starting from 1998. There's relatively few papers about this. I think part of the reason is because, well, you know, it doesn't really tell you anything about what they're uh, talking about. So we try to, and uh, there are some exceptions to this. There are some papers here, you know, uh, the Blanis Vidal, Draca, and Von Frozen, who, who looked at uh, the returns to lobbyists as uh, the lobbyists, as the senators that they worked for uh, in the past, exit Senate, the Senate. And then uh, there's been uh, work on, uh, by De Figueredo and Silverman on, on ear earmarks on uni for universities, and they find a positive effect on lobbying, of lobbying on, on uh, returns for universities, on, on earmarks for universities. But, so how do we do this? How do we try to disentangle this? Well, the question that we ask is sort of indirect. We say, okay, well imagine that they're trying to communicate information through lobbyists to the politician, okay? So the lobbyist then should be an expert in some kind of topic, right? So, and uh, otherwise it's not obvious why you're talking to the lobbyist and talks to the politician, right? And of course there are two views here. So if you're sitting here, you're thinking, well, if I want to talk to Trump now, um, I would try to talk to him myself if I can communicate the information myself, right? I can do that. Or I would have to go through a lobbyist and then the lobbyist talks to him. Why would I talk to the lobbyist? So one possibility is that the lobbyist knows what Trump's Trump thinks or Trump wants. And so they can better communicate things that are relevant to his re-election probabilities and things like that. A more benign view is that th that uh, lobbyist actually knows about <coughs> Pfizer and the pharmaceutical industry and actually they know about what's the best structure of patents that you can possibly come up with, which I mean, you know, that's a, that's a stretch again, but, but that's a possibility. So how do we think of this? Well, the thought experiment is the following. So we use these sort of famous sort of that I said, you know, committee assignments. So the, the thought experiment is the following. Imagine that um, you are a lobbyist, uh, sorry, imagine that you are a, a politician that's on the financial services committee. And now because of various uh, events, you get switched to the energy committee. What we do is that we try to look at what a lobbyist does as a result of that. So initially the lobbyist is working with you on financial services, They're, you're working on financial services and he's talking to you and everything. But then as he moves to energy, we say, well, if you're a lobbyist and you're an expert in financial services, when he moves to energy, you shouldn't move to energy if you're an expert in financial services. You should stick to financial services. And so what we're able to do is we, uh, we can trace that and so, um, we, we use these committee switchers to, uh, to um, uh, essentially look at the following, uh, the following object. So imagine that Scott and I, he's the, do you want to be the politician or the lobbyist? Lobbyist. You want to be the politician, okay. <laughs> Good choice. All right, so I'm the lobbyist, and so Scott is moving to a, a new committee. So it entails moving to new issues. Okay, so it's gonna cover a bunch of new issues. And I, as the, as the lobbyist, will in the next Congress will also work on some issues. And I'm gonna create a measure that says how much our issues overlap in the next Congress. And let's say that today we are connected. I can measure that I'm giving campaign contributions to, uh, to Scott, okay? So then what we can see is that if I'm giving campaign contributions to him in this period, the probability that we work on the same topics when he switches is up to 50% higher compared to if we were not connected by campaign contributions, okay? So the idea is that if we're connected, then I'm much more likely to switch topics to follow whatever he's doing. And the interpretation of that, I think, it doesn't leave much room for the expertise view. That essentially, I'm not really an expert. I'm an expert on Scott, okay? I know him. And again, you know, you, it doesn't have to be bad, but I, essentially it's possible that I'm really conveying information to him, that Pfizer is actually giving me some useful information for the patent, you know, uh, um, uh, patent con content. But the thing is I'm not really an expert on patent because the moment he moves to another topic, I just move with him. 
And so what I may be an expert on is how to tell him what to do or how this information can play well in his electoral sort of uh, re-election concern. Um, and so in the, along this view, we find that, you know, expert lobbyists make money, but connected lobbyists make more money. So if you're an expert uh, lobbyist, uh, and we define as an expert somebody that consistently works on a topic, so more than 25% of his time, of her time, his time is spent on, on, uh, on a topic, is gets higher return. But if you are uh, a connected one, meaning that you have a lot of these connections to politicians, then you get twice as much. So the, the, the extra return from being an, a connected uh, lobbyist is twice as big as to, for being an expert. Yes. That's totally fine, yeah, yeah, it's possible, it's possible. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, it's possible, yeah, so that could be a reflection that earning the trust of the politician is a, co is a costly and long-term investment that you have to, you know, have, sorry? You have a high return, yeah, because it was a costly investment in the sense that you know, it took you a long time to gain, you know, a long time and, you know, I don't know what you did to become the, you know, to, to, uh, to gain the trust. You know, you pos possibly have had to, you know, talk to him, you know, many times and convince him that his, you know, that you understand his, you know, policy preferences very well and you can be, you know, uh, useful in communicating that information, right? So, um, that is possible too. Um, and I'm going to skip the last point because it's a little bit convoluted. So... So th I think, you know, the, 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 the sort of the, uh, the lobbying part of this is one that gives us, I'm just trying to keep track of time. We, we go to 5.45, right? Yes. Well, 5.50, whatever. The earlier, the better. And that's, that's your face I got. <laughs> um, you know, if people are dying to ask me questions, I'm really happy to take them now. <laughs> so, um, and so I'm... And that's the, the most, I mean, at least to me, exciting part of the, of the presentation. So this is um, charitable contribution. So you're thinking, okay, now you're going to really stretch it. Why, why would charitable contributions have anything to do with lobbying? Well, there's, you know, people are creative. Okay? So they find dif different ways to uh, be useful to a politician. Okay? So this is a few motivating uh, facts. Facts, uh, quotes, and but I we have uh, so many, uh, and uh, you know we're gonna include all of them in the paper when when we write it. But I was so happy to see this quote. Okay, so this is again this is work uh, joint work with Marianne Bertrand, Ray Fisman, and Francesco Trebbi. 2017 is a t tentative at this point, but you know uh, the work is, is is here. This work. So so let's read this together. So so this is Joe Baca, which you may not know, but. Um, he's an LA, uh, he's a uh, uh, representative in uh, uh, California district. He achieved near celebrity status in suburban Los Angeles district thanks to a charity his family set up three years ago to aid local organizations. It provides another benefit too, helping the Democratic congressman run something akin to a permanent political campaign. But unlike most private foundations, Mr. Baca gets little of its money from its, outside, for it, from its founder's pocket. Instead, local companies and major corporations that have often turned to Mr. Baca's Washington office for help uh, and usually succeed in getting it are the chief donors. So this is how um, you know, we, we sort of thought of looking at corporate social responsibility as another potential channel in which you know, uh, an interest group, a corporation, can say, mm, I'm not going to give you money directly to your campaign, but... I will give money to a foundation, to a charity that's in your district and that you can take credit for and then uh, that's going to help you in your re-election uh, efforts, which is what this other quote says. It says, the top Republican on the House Energy and Commerce Committee operates a foundation that's raised donations from the industries this um, committee oversees, taking credit when companies give directly to community groups in the foundation's name essentially by passing a 2007 congressional requirement that um, should be disclosed. And then this is Barton. This is, his name is Barton. 
And the Barton Foundation also promised to help build the 1.2 million boys and girls club in Corsicana, Texas, and those attending the meeting burst into applause. Okay? This was also publicized in the press. Now, this is where the corporation comes in. So who is this that gives these contributions? Exelon, which is an er energy company. Um, contribution was made at the time when Mr. Barton was proposing legislation that would help expand the market for nuclear energy. Exelon also had uh, been negotiating for government approval to build a multi-million dollar nuclear power plant in Mr. Barton's home state. This is Texas. Now, this uh, essentially sort of makes the case that, again, these uh, corporations have another way, an alternative way, and, and less visible way of doing this. And so what are the advantages from a corporation point of view of using corporate social responsibility? Well, again, the con foundation can contribute to a cause that's close to the politician interest without being subject to any limitations of these uh, donations. And the politician can take credit for it, all right? And it is, again, as I said, less visible and less regulated. So how do we go about this and how do you, and I'll give you, yes. Electoral. That's, a, that's what we're thinking, although we don't have any hard uh, measure on it. But this is something that potentially, yeah, I don't know if we can look at it. Because again, it would, it would, you, would ha you only have one vote. You know, and so you can't just look at any, that you don't have any source of variation to see whether you know, this amount of spending. I guess you could use it in the same way that, that the channel that I didn't look at, for example, you know, at the beginning was the, the, imp the impact of campaign contribution on votes, on voters, right? That's another. Pandora's box, right, that, you know, it's hard to estimate the effect of campaign contributions on actual election results. But you could use the same techniques that have been used by Levitt of using, you know, repeat races and things like that and use these uh, sort of, you know, pair fixed effects. It's, it's not great, but that's, uh, that's potentially something that we could look at. Now, uh, where does this data come from? Well, this is, uh, um, so first of all, we started off with uh, uh, sort of big companies. Okay, so this, the sample is the union of uh, Fortune 500 and S&P 500 companies with a foundation. Okay, so this is only 328, took a long time to go through this, so, but we're extending the, the data set, this is what we have so far. Now importantly, we have the data on who, you know, on which charities these co corporations, foundations give money to. So we have the recipient of these money. And so, um, and then we know where these both where the, the foundation is, which is easy because that's usually where the, the company is, but we know in which the address of each charity they give money to. And we can map that to the congressional district in which a politician is running, that, that the politician is representing, okay? Uh, I think that's all you need from this slide. Now, and this is what I said in the first one, is that we match the corporation, the corporation donation uh, recipients to the, uh, to, the, to, look at, to the congressional uh, uh, district. And then at the same time, we've collect, you know, we put together the same data for the same destination you know, for PACs. Okay, so I'll present the, the data so that, that you can compare apple with apples with the same uh, identification strategy and see how big you know, PACs uh, are and, uh, and, uh, and uh, donations are. Uh, the lobbying data is the one that I described before. And then, again, the representative, we also have the committee assignment, which is sort of coming from standard sources. And then we have representative tenure, and then I'm gonna talk about uh, the other parts later. All right, so this is a very basic, very basic specification, okay? So, as I said, we're gonna use something that we can find an instrument for, which is the law, you know, the, the, um, the essentially the overlap, this is, the, this is important, this is the, the, the right-hand side variable, is a measure of the following, uh, is, a, is a measure of how much, how many issues are covered in a committee in which politician uh, in District D sits. I'm gonna say it again a couple of times, okay? So uh, the politician in District D sits on a bunch of committees, okay? Those committees cover issues all right, so we know the mapping, to, we know which energy and commerce, which issue they cover. And from the lobbying data, we know which issues a company cares about because that's what they lobby on. And so we can identify 
the, the number of issues that are covered by each politician in a given Congress. If I sit on energy, I cover energy and commerce, okay? And so if you care about energy and commerce, then that's gonna measure two issues. There's a two issue overlap. Everything, when I say log is actually log of one plus, and I'm, I'm, I'll deal with, you know, uh, there are more sophisticated ways of dealing with zeros, which I'm very aware of as a trade economist, but, uh, um, you know, this is the first pass and there's a lot of fixed effects here. So, um, so, the, so that's the right-hand side variable. The left-hand side variable is just the contributions, and it will be PAC contributions and charitable contributions. And then what do we do? Well, we are very uh, uh, conservative and you know, we try with the hardest fixed effect you can possibly use, which is the foundation uh, district fixed effect. Okay, so we're only using the within fun, you know, foundation district variation you know, in, its most, in the most restrictive specification, okay? So uh, now, of course, so I hope that's clear. So again, what, let me just, the left-hand side is very, it's, it's pretty obvious, is how much money a foundation gives to either uh, a firm gives, either through the, its foundation or through the, its PAC to a politician in District D. And to the right is the number of issues that the politician covers that are of interest to that, to that uh, firm because of the lobbying data that we have. Okay, now. This is what I just said. Okay, great, so I don't have to do it. All right, so in terms of um, the basic you know, stats here. So campaign contributions are limited. Okay, so the biggest campaign contribution you're gonna see here is $20,000, because that's as much as they can give. They can give $10,000 for each congressional race, which means that if you have a, um, a primary and uh, the, uh, the general election, that's two races times two, that's $20,000. So that's why the max is 20,000. Of course, the, the largest foundation gives $38 million, which is a lot. And just in case you wonder what that is, these are two banks. One is Goldman Sachs and the other one is Citibank. And just, you know, one is in Ohio and the other one is in Virginia. Just two basic, two random, uh, um, you know, non-swing at all uh, states, okay? Uh, actually, the, the, I have to be on, honestly, Virginia 8th is not a uh, swing uh, district because it's, uh, it's the one right next to DC, which is uh, sort of solidly uh, democratic. But, so, but first you notice that these are much larger numbers. Okay, so the average uh, charitable contribution is $12,000. The average PAC contribution is $250. Again, this is average because there's a lot of zeros. I reported that essentially the 90th percentile is still zero. Okay, so I reported on 95th because that's, you know, where it starts getting positive. So, but this is the universe of all the possible combinations. So, you know, you just don't give to all the politicians. You give to 10% of them, okay? And you don't give contributions to every pot potential congressional district. There are 435 of them, so you give to only 40. Now, of course, the moment you look at this regression, you're like, oh, well, I have some, you know, uh, identification, you know, issues here, you know, uh, primarily I'm, I'm, I'm concerned about unobserved shock. I mean, I'm, I'm concerned primarily if I don't put any fixed effects about permanent differences between these districts. So for example, a corporation like Car Cargill may want to give money to Arkansas districts just because it's an agricultural uh, firm and it just likes to give money in agricultural state. That's the easy one to fix, so you put a corporation or a foundation uh, district, uh, well, state fixed effect. Now, the, the more concerning one is if uh, Arkansas is not agricultural to begin with and becomes agricultural, and then as it becomes agricultural, Cargill starts being interested in that, and so these are time varying and observed effects, right? And so, of course, uh, the politician also from the, in, you know, and, and importantly, obviously, is that the politician from Arkansas over time may get more interested in getting on the agricultural committee. So there's a, there's a time varying potential concern. So how do we address that? By finding an instrument for the issues covered, okay? So this actually is, is, is you know, takes a few steps, but it's straightforward once you um, um, see it, I think. All right, so, well, we try to predict your membership on a committee, essentially. 
So your membership on our committee, unless you're already on the committee, which that's easy, or you can also leave a committee, right? So, so how do you get on a committee? Well, uh, there has to be a seat open in the committee, okay? And the seat has to be of your party. So that's one part of our instrument. So, oops, oh, well, um, sorry about that. Just, I, I didn't check this uh, equation, but so it's essentially all the interaction of these three uh, objects. So first of all, the openings, okay? So openings available in, in, the con in Congress. And how do openings change? Well, openings change because people, because there are changes in, the, in, the, in control of the House, right? So when the House switches from uh, um, Democrat to Republican, then the seats available on committees change because the majority has more seats, obviously. Now, there's tenure, which is not listed here for a reason I don't understand. Uh, so there's your seniority. So that seniority plays a huge role in the assignment to committees. So your, your rank in, uh, in Congress gets you on the committee. But more importantly is the rank, your current uh, committee assignment. If, a, an opening open, if there's an opening in a committee that's worse than the ones I'm on, I don't want to go there. So I'm only going to look at the committees uh, you know, essentially how, you know, the committee, whether the committee is better or worse than what I currently have. And what do we use for that? We call this, we use this G ratio, which is essentially using a measure that political scientists have come up with, which is desirability of committee by revealed preferences. So the, this is a, uh, an index they call gross closed because it's by, um, it's, actually, it's called, well, anyway, it's actually called gross worth, but anyways, I, I, I misspelled it, but anyway. So, um, so this is the, how we predict uh, the membership. And uh, um, so once we have the predicted men membership, okay, then we turn issue covered into a essentially predicted issue coverage. Okay, so there's, uh, there's another step that I'm gonna sort of skip for, uh, sort of, because um, it's a bit detailed, but so here's the, when I look at the two results, so if I look at OLS and IV. Okay, so the OLS, and again, I'm putting different uh, fixed effects in there. Oh, this is just a correlation, actually. Sorry, we're starting with the correlation. So this is just a correlation between charitable campaign contributions, uh, charitable, <laughs> campaign contrib charitable contributions and PAC contributions, okay? So you see that, you know, if I start with just controlling for Foundation F and state and Congress fixed effect that have a positive correlation, which essentially becomes smaller, but highly significant no matter, you know, even if you get to the, the, more, the more stringent uh, fixed effect, which is the foundation Congress, congressional district fixed effect, okay? And Congress fixed effect. So you see that that's even, that I was very surprised to even see this because I mean, they shouldn't be correlated for any reason, right? There's no good reason other than using them strategically that it should be correlated. But more importantly, they behave in the same way when you regress them on the variable of interest here, which is this issue covered. And so here I just report just for the magnitudes in case you're interested, but the right-hand side variable is actually a count variable that takes at most three, uh, seven as a value, so it's not, you know, the log doesn't do uh, a lot. Um, so, so this is sort of, if you look at charity and PAC. So you see here, obviously, the coefficients are quite different. They're highly significant, even, you know, they're not significant when you put the more restrictive one. So, so the, the one that, but the IV will actually be better than this. So the found, this is foundation state fixed effect and Congress. So you see that the two are highly correlated. I mean, you know, I'll, I'll give you the magnitude in a second. And also if you put it in level. Um, now here, PAC survives this uh, sort of more restrictive uh, fixed effect. Charity doesn't in OLS, but it does. And I, I should say that the clustering here is at foundation state uh, level. I'm very open to other clustering uh, uh, suggestions, which I'm sure will come from this area. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> um, so, and, and, but uh, so this is the interesting part is sort of the IV. The, in the IV, I think the, the most interesting part is that charities are obviously, you know, we, we did our best to match them but they're really noisily uh, uh, assigned uh, because there's, you know, there's a huge amount of work that goes into a, a lot of dirty data to match geographically also. And so, what, oops, what we have here is that when you instrument for the charity, there's a big bump in the coefficient. 
and uh, it becomes essentially one fifth of the pack one. Okay, so the elasticity becomes a fifth of the pack one. And so now, uh, you know, and again, it survives both fixed effects now. Okay, so, uh, so this is really the best, sort of this sort of specification is the one, the best that shows that campaign contributions in PAC, oh, sorry, <laughs> charitable contributions in PAC sort of move in a very, very similar way with respect to having a common interest with the politician, okay? Now, how big is this effect? Um, well, here's the following. So I'm gonna compare it uh, to um, the other studies that I mentioned use sort of a similar technology in, in terms of using committee assignment. So if I use the, essentially uh, an increase in uh, issue covered by one, uh, increases PAC contribution by 43%, and increases charity contributions by 4.7%. Now because charitable contributions are much bigger, this actually translates into an increase of, for each firm, for each firm of $109 and versus 565. But if you multiply for all the firms, then that's about, perf you know, if you, if you take the total, that's $150,000. Now, how that, does that compare with other papers, okay? Well, with the paper, the, the most recent papers find that, for example, so this, this, this is a very nice paper by Powell and Grimmer in the Journal of Politics that finds that when you are exiled from a committee, so I don't know if, you, what, does anybody know what ex being exiled from a committee means? It's when you are, when you're in the majority and, and your party uh, loses and then so the, you know, if you're the last one in the food chain, you go uh, because there's a switch in the majority and so you gotta leave. Um, and so they find, for example, I mean, I'm just putting a number here for the energy and commerce. I mean, you have uh, for other ones, but exile from the energy and commerce uh, com committee uh, loses about, you lose in total about $97,000 from the energy companies as, a, as an aggregate. Now, um, Barry and Fowler also have a similar strategy, but uh, they look at entering a committee that is relevant for an industry increases PACs by 62%, which is very similar to our 43, I mean, sort of, or same order of magnitude as our number. So, um, so this is sort of a potential channel that hasn't been explored that I know of uh, in the literature, which, uh, you know, and, and it's big. And so uh, we're very excited about this, uh, uh, this result. You know, we're, you know, again, you know, this is very preliminary, but uh, um, I think this is a channel that we wanna push. So finally, um, this is very, very much uh, work in progress. This is the last channel that I put on the slide, which is, regulatory agencies. Now I'm now convinced that this is where a lot of the action is. And uh, um, so what we looked at is Dodd-Frank. As you know, Dodd-Frank was passed in 2010, but um, a lot of it was not implemented. Uh, and you know, it took a, a while for all the rules that was, were necessary to implement the law to be passed. And when you have rules that implement a law, the law is very generic and you, know, you don't know all the details. And so the agencies are in charge, and especially these five agencies, the SEC, the Fed, CFTC and the OCC and the FDIC are in charge of uh, implementing uh, the, the, the financial regulation. Do I'm assuming that you've heard of Dodd-Frank. And so, um, and so the, um, what we do here is to try to understand how interest groups affected the change in the rules over time. Obviously this is a really hard task because this requires going into the detail of the rules and how they changed, all the, 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 uh, the language of the rules changed. And so, um, and, but there is a nice sort of uh, structure to this is that, let's say the, F the Fed comes, uh, the Fed and the, and the SEC come up with a rule, well they have to publish the preliminary rule, then there's 60 days for comment and you, I, we can all submit comments. They all get published, they're all, publi they're all public. And then after 60 days, then the window closes and then there's another rule that comes out. And so you can see the change in the rule. So what we did is sort of a uh, sort of linguistic, uh, computational linguistic type of analysis here, looking at the content of these rules. And so in, in what, and what are we looking for? Well, we're trying to measure when the rules change, in favor of whom do they change, okay? So this is a project uh, that's sort of ongoing. 
uh, with again Marianne Bertrand and Francesco Trebi, but also Brad Hakkinen, who's a student at UBC. And so what we do, what we did, is measuring. Essentially, what you do is that you take every comment in the rules itself. You break it into parts. These uh, uh, through this bag of words. And so then these, these individual parts, you have frequencies of, of words for each document. And, there, and then you try to have this expression. And then what, what happens is that you can predict who did the comment. You can run a kind of a logit where you try to predict who made the comment based on the words that were used. And so we try to, for each comment, try to predict who sent it. Was it a bank? Was it somebody like you and me, just you know, the public? Or was it? Uh, um, well, actually, it's, that's it, basically. So you know, there's other other firms sometimes, but mo mostly they are, they are banks. So I'm just going to skip the details here. But this is the kind of graph that we are sort of obtaining now. So every single so this is days. You know, this is a particular rule. This is the sort of the famous sort of uh, skin in the game rule that sort of predict that uh, requi required you you as a as a bank as a security issuer to keep 5% of the security that was issued to make sure that you're not issuing junk, right? So you keep some of it on the books, right? Now, of course, the, the banks lobbied a lot and sort of complained that this was very costly for the banks to keep all this on their, on their, uh, you know, on their, on their, on their uh, balance sheets. And so, um, but anyways, this is, this is, and they tried to sort of relax this, this requirement. So this is the, at the beginning of the, this is sort of at the beginning of the, uh, of, the, of the rule, the sort of the preliminary rule. The preliminary rule, if you try to rank it in a space where you put, essentially the banks are the red dots and the, uh, the public is sort of the gray dots, okay? And then you have the blues that are non-banks. You see that initially, uh, sort of the rule was kind of in between if you look at the language of this. But then over time, we know that that, ru that rule was changed. We know actually for a fact by reading the content of this that the rule was changed in favor of the banks. And so we can trace this uh, uh, over time to sort of check that it became closer to what the banks wanted. Now, if we look at other rules, this didn't happen for all of them. And so what we were trying to understand is sort of the pattern of this. And this is not easy, but this is sort of where we're going with this. So, but potentially, we think this is another interesting sort of and very relevant channel. So I'm just going to. You know, I think you know. I, I've given you a lot of channels <laughs> that you can maybe come up with new ones, but the, I think this is sort of the, the view here is that this market for policy, where I give you money and you give me vo a vote, is probably too crude. That's a lot more sophisticated than that. And so they use, you know, interest groups use different channels. They target specific position in Congress, so a specific committee assignment, and you may just talk to them not to get a vote, but to get maybe. A, a sentence struck out or a sentence added or who knows. Um, and those are channels that are less transparent. So in particular, communication, but also these charitable contributions. I mean, they be can become more regulated, but they currently aren't. And so, and finally, I think, you know, the underlying theme here <laughs> is that maybe I've talked as if this is all bad. I guess that's the presumption in a lot of these papers. But this is an unresolved question, you know. Well, maybe it's good that the rules went closer to what the banks wanted. I don't know. I mean, I'm just going to say it just because it's possible, okay? And, uh, and we just don't know how to do that at the moment. So I hope somebody comes up with that uh, uh, soon. Um, okay, that's uh, all I want to say.